Good morning. It is Friday at about uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, and I'm coming to you with the video lecture for this week. It's about the American Revolution, and uh, I want to start first with the Seven Years' War. Uh, we know this better in many cases as the French and Indian War, but it's actually a European war that spills out into America. Uh, being a global war, it's going to last for seven years, which is why it's called the Seven Years' War. But here in the American colonies, it's over before 1760. Um, it's really going to be a fight between France and England. This fight is going to happen in Europe. This fight's going to happen in parts of Africa and Asia and India. And then, of course, here in what becomes the United States. The other thing you have to know is it actually begins because of the American colonies. This was a point in time where what we know of today as Ohio and Pennsylvania were both claimed by France and by England. And France is going to build some forts in the area of what is today Pittsburgh and Erie, Pennsylvania. The colony of Virginia claimed those same lands and when word gets out that there's fort building being done, the governor of Virginia is going to send uh, a militia to go and figure out what's happening. And in this militia is General Edward Braddock and a little known officer named George Washington. George Washington and Edward Braddock are going to lead missions in 1754 and 1755 against these French forts. Both parties are going to be beaten badly by the French, and Britain is going to end up declaring war in 1756. During this war, the British and their Native American allies are going to defeat the French and their Native American allies here in North America, and the British are going to capture basically every important French city. They're going to get New Orleans, St. Louis, Detroit, Montreal, Quebec, uh, Pittsburgh, you name it. So the war is going to end in 1763 once all the fighting in the rest of the world wraps up. And the biggest thing to know from the Treaty of Paris 1763 is quite simply France is going to be excluded from North America from then on. Uh, France is going to give up Canada and all of its territory to, to England after this war is over. The other really big thing is something called the Proclamation of 1763. Once the war is over, the king is going to issue this Proclamation of 1763 that says the colonists cannot move past the Appalachian Mountains. The land between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River is supposed to be reserved for Native Americans. The real reason why this is made is, quite frankly, the king didn't want to pay to protect settlers who were going to live in the middle of the country. So we'll keep all of our people to the east, we'll let Native Americans live to the west, and we'll be done. This doesn't work for the colonists, though. Uh, because much of the war was fought in the colonies, the British thought that the colonists needed to pay for the war, and because it was a war that was started by the colonists, the British Crown was like, yeah, you need to pay for this. The, on the other hand, though, the settlers, or the colonists, they were like, we fought and we died for this war, we should be able to live there. Well, in 1763, King George III is going to appoint a guy named Lord Grenville to be the new prime minister. And Lord Grenville, one of his primary charges is to figure out how to pay for this war. And Lord Grenville is going to say, the colonists started the war, the colonists are going to pay. So Lord Grenville is going to have the Sugar Act and the Currency Act passed through Parliament. The Sugar Act, its goal was to raise money and stop the smuggling of sugar. And the Currency Act was to outlaw paper currency, or I should say colonial currency, in the colonies. Paper money would still be accepted, but it had to be British pounds. At the same time that this is happening, there is a group that has formed in Northern England known as the Real Whigs. 
And the real Whigs, they're going to talk about how the king is corrupt, the politicians are corrupt, that uh, monarchy is the worst form of government ever. And that just so happens to be exactly what the colonists wanted to hear at that moment. So when the real Whigs come over to the colonies, uh, the colonists are going to just eat it up and love it. In 1765, Parliament is going to pass something called the Stamp Act. And the Stamp Act, its goal is to make a stamp be put on any paper product, newspapers, pamphlets, wills, deeds, playing cards, and that stamp is going to signify that you paid an extra tax for that item. Now this is going to be very, very hard hitting on people who are upper and middle class, doctors, lawyers, bankers, anybody who deals with a lot of this written material, they're not going to appreciate it. And there are going to be resistance groups that form. There's a Stamp Act Congress that's going to write letters to Parliament that says, hey, this isn't right, you need to get rid of it. The Sons of Liberty is going to form in the East Coast cities, and they're going to be lawyers and merchants and tradesmen who resist the Stamp Act and refuse to pay the tax. And then, most famously, in the Virginia House of Burgesses, a guy named James Otis Jr. is going to say taxation without representation is tyranny. We know that better today as no taxation without representation. Eventually, the Stamp Act will be repealed by the next Prime Minister, a guy named Lord Rockingham. But Lord Rockingham will replace the Stamp Act with something called the Declaratory Act. And the Declaratory Act of 1766 basically says Parliament can tax you and do whatever it wants to the colonists. You have no say. King George III, who was kind of mentally ill by this point, he's going to appoint a new prime minister in 1767. And that new prime minister is named William Pitt. Uh, William Pitt, his first job is to figure out if the colonists are paying their fair share of taxes or not. It turns out they aren't. And so William Pitt is going to appoint a guy named Charles Townsend to be the head of the exchequer. Uh, the exchequer, it's a fancy word for saying the head of the treasury. He's the tax accountant for the parliament, basically. Now, Townsend is going to go through the books, and he's going to discover the colonists still owe money, and he says, we need to create more taxes to get this money paid. So the Townsend Act is going to put a tax on imported and exported goods. And the biggest difference between the Townsend Act and other taxes before, the taxes before were typically on goods not from England. So if you were getting something from Spain or from France or another country, you had to pay an import or an export tax there. If it was a British good, no taxes had to be paid. However, with Townsend Acts, even things coming from Britain, you now have to pay an import tax, so it's going to hit much harder than it did before. When the Townsend Acts are put into place, Boston is just going to lose it, because Boston was already a hotbed of rebels. They resisted the Townsend Acts, and in the year 1770, in March... The Boston Massacre is going to happen March 2nd. Workers in Boston are going to attack the British troops. There's no serious harm. But then the next Monday on March the 5th, the workers are going to come back and they're going to throw stuff at the, the troops. It's, snowballs are going to have rocks in the middle of them. And when these rock-filled snowballs hit the troops, the troops open fire. And five people are killed despite the fact that the British soldiers were told not to shoot anybody. This is when that real Whig view that was already popular really catches on. And the crown, the king, and his government are seen as completely evil. And this is going to be really where 
we start to get to that point of no return. In 1773, the Tea Act is passed, and the primary goal of the Tea Act was to save the British East India Trading Company from going out of business. The British East India Trading Company was the largest company of the world. It was the only company authorized by the British government to sell tea in the colonies. And a portion of every bit of tea that was sold by the BI or BEIC went specifically back to that company. To give you an idea how big this company was, the territory of India was not a British government colony. It was a British East India trading company colony. Uh, basically, if Microsoft owned a third world country, that's what we're looking at with the BEIC. So it was so big that it could not fail and the government was going to keep it working no matter what. As a result of the Tea Act in December of 1773, about a third of Boston's population demands that the tea from the British East India Trading Company be sent back and the governor of Boston, the governor of Massachusetts refuses to do that. So in the middle of the night, somewhere between 60 and 100 men are going to dress up like Native Americans and board these tea ships and start sh throwing tea into Boston Harbor. Now it's not little tea bags like today. Back then, tea was sold in bricks that weighed a couple of pounds. So they're throwing pounds and pounds and pounds of bricks, something like 10,000 pounds of tea into the Boston Harbor. As a result of the Boston Tea Party, the British government, led by a guy named Lord North, is going to pass the Coercive Acts, which closed the port of Boston and, and put Boston under martial law, and also the Quebec Acts, which is going to give Catholics freedom in Quebec. Why do the colonists care about that? Because this is still a point in time where Catholics and Protestants didn't get along very well. In September of 1774, 55 delegates from all 13 colonies are going to meet in Philadelphia, and this becomes known as the First Continental Congress. The biggest thing that comes out of the First Continental Congress is the Declaration of Rights and Grievances, where the colonists agree we will obey Parliament if there are bona fide acts of Parliament that we have a say in. Well, that is not really going to happen because the Parliament does not give the colonists any actual representation. At the same time that this is going on, or very shortly after, I should say, um, we come to the battles of Lexington and Concord, which are really the first battles of the American Revolution. In April of 1775, General Thomas Gage, who is the commanding officer for the British Army in Boston, is going to get word that resistance leaders are gathering at the city of, of uh, Concord. And Thomas Gage is ordered to take his troops to the city of Concord and arrest these rebels. On April 18, 1775, Thomas Gage's troops leave from Boston to go to Concord. And that's where the famous ride of Paul Revere happens, where the British are coming, the British are coming. Uh, by the way, it didn't really happen that way. Uh, Paul Revere was captured. Uh, one of his other people named William Dawes was um was captured as well. The only person who actually made it through was the one we never talk about. Uh, his name was Samuel Prescott. So why was it called the, the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere? He was the richest and best known of the three. On April 19th, after people were warned the British are coming, uh, the British Army gets to the city of Lexington. And at the city of Lexington, uh, American militiamen gather and there's a fight that breaks out. Uh, the American militiamen are scared off and the British are going to capture or go to Concord, capture some of the relatives and steal a bunch of guns and then start marching back to Boston. What the British army does not know is that over 20,000 colonial militiamen have gathered outside Boston and they're ready to go and fight the British army. In May of 1776, we are going to get the Second Continental Congress meeting. And the reason the Second Continental Congress is going to meet 
is because there's actually a battle in June of 1775 outside of Boston. Uh, the British are going to send something like 2,500 soldiers to defeat or fight the American militia. The American militia, they're going to beat back the British Redcoats twice. But when the third attack happens, the American militia has to uh, scatter. So by May of 1776, Boston is under firm control of the British Army and the Second Con Continental Congress. Their goal is to try and find a peaceful solution so this fighting does not get worse. The Second Continental Congress is going to have members from most, but not all, of the colonies. And they're going to come up with something known as the Olive Branch Petition. And in the Olive Branch Petition, uh, they're going to say, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, uh, we still love the king, we still want to be part of the British Empire, but we want to be treated like British subjects and treated the right way. Uh, this is known as the Olive Branch Petition, and the king, he didn't take it that way. Uh, the king read this petition. He was angry. He decided that the rebels, or that the colonists are rebelling against him, and he orders the government to crush this building rebellion. George III orders the army to treat the colonists like open and avowed enemies. So we know that we're going to war. And it's, I think it's really important to know that not everybody supported the war. Uh, it was about 20% of the colonists remaining loyal, 40% of the colonists saying that they are going to rebel, and another 40% of the colonists who just have no idea. So this war could have gone either way because no, nobody had 50%. Nobody had majority support. The rebels are going to end up winning the day primarily because of a guy named Thomas Paine and his essay called Common Sense. Common Sense, by the way, you do have to read this week. It is a little long, so don't wait till the last minute, please. Common Sense by Thomas Paine, it's going to approach this from multiple ways. And he's going to say, it's just common sense that we don't stay part of the British Empire. Britain is too far away to protect us. They don't have our economic interests in mind. They're going to say what we can and can't do. Uh, if you want to look at the biblical argument, there's not supposed to be a king. If you want to look at the hereditary argument, uh, the king of England doesn't have anybody to answer to, and he's not even Englishman if you go back far enough in history. Uh, the king of England is actually related to the French. Uh, he uses many, many different arguments, and they're very good. And, and I definitely want you to make sure that you read Common Sense well. What were the different strategies that were going to be employed during the American Revolution? Well, the British are just going to see this as any other war. Their plan is to control the cities, defeat the military, and win. Overwhelming victory. The Americans know that if they last long enough that the parliament won't be able to fund the war. So the American strategy is just to win people over, get help from others, and wear down the British. Basically, the Americans are just going to play the long-term game, play defense until Britain gives up. Now, this is not a military history class, so I'm not going to make you know a lot of the battles. I'm just giving you a couple of them. The Battle of Long Island is the first battle of the war after the Declaration of Independence. It's the largest battle of the war. George Washington has been appointed the leader of the, of the army. A sort of government has been formed. It's not an official government, but all the different colonies are working together. And George Washington is told, raise an army. Here's some money for the war and um, let's make a go of it. So on Long Island, George Washington is gonna have his troops dig in on the shoreline and build basically foxholes in the, in the sand. Problem is, 
the British Navy is the best equipped, largest, and strongest Navy in the world. They just back their battleships up to the, to the island and start firing. George Washington is very quickly going to have to retreat. And he retreats all the way to the cities of Trenton and Princeton in New Jersey. And this is going to be over Christmas break. George Washington is going to have his troops surprise a group of soldiers known as Hessians. They're German soldiers from the area known as Hess, H-E-S-S. -S. And the area of Hess just happened to be allied with Britain. So Britain was using Hessian soldiers. Well, it was, and I'm not making this up, it was the day of Christmas or Christmas Eve when the American soldiers are going to find the Hessians. The Hessians are celebrating Christmas. They're a, a little bit less than sober. And Washington wins this surprise victory against a superior force. News of this gets out and people start signing up for the military in large numbers. Later that year, Britain is going to invade from, from Quebec and try to march down the Hudson River. American soldiers are going to cut off the supply routes behind this British army, and the British army is going to turn around and go back to, to Quebec and stop their attack on New York City. Valley Forge is not a battle, but it's really important. I guess you could say it's a battle against themselves. Uh, in the winter of 1777, uh, Valley Forge is going to be where George Washington keeps his troops for that winter. And I think it's really important to know that in the 1600s, 1700s, and even in the 1800s, war was not a year-round thing. Uh, the battles either stopped or really died down during the winter because they didn't have uh, the equipment to survive those long winters. So Valley Forge is where Washington asked for his winter supplies to be sent to. George Washington gets his army to Valley Forge, and believe it or not, those supplies weren't delivered like they were supposed to be. So many people in George Washington's army are going to either starve or get disease or be nourished, uh, exposure, basically frostbite, and he loses somewhere like 2,500 to 3,000 of his soldiers. A positive that happens, though, is this Prussian general named Baron von Steuben is going to come and volunteer to serve in Washington's army. Uh, the Prussian army is the strongest and best trained army in Europe, and Baron von Steuben is going to train the American army in the way that the Germans fought. When the winter is over, the soldiers who survive are going to be considered true professional soldiers, and they are able to drill, they're able to shoot straight, they're able to march, and Baron von Steuben, in many ways, is what creates the American army. Once the French see that the Americans have a chance to win, and that the Americans are going to be able to hold their own, France is going to get involved and become the ally of America as a result. There are battles everywhere. There are battles in, in Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. There are battles in Virginia. Uh, it, it's going to be through all 13 colonies. So uh, even though I'm not talking about all the battles, just know that they do happen all over the place. By the time we get to 1781, this war has been going on for a while, and the general in charge of most of the British forces, General Cornwallis, is going to go to Virginia, to the coast of Virginia, because it's going to be winter, and that's where he's going to wait for his resupply, he's going to wait for his reinforcements, and he's going to wait for the British uh, Navy to show up. So where Cornwallis is going to rest for the winter is known today as Yorktown. And Yorktown was on a peninsula. It was surrounded on three sides by water. He thought that was to his advantage. But what really happens is Washington blocks the, the land access, puts his cannons and his men on the opposite sides of the peninsula, leaving only one way for Cornwallis to get help, and that's from the ocean. 
which would still be okay because Cornwallis thinks, hey, I've got the British Navy. It's the strongest Navy in the world. What he doesn't know is that the French Navy is down in the West Indies, basically in Bermuda, not Bermuda, but the Bahamas. And the French Navy is going to sail north and block the British Navy from getting to Cornwallis. So there's this siege, this surrounding that goes on for a couple of weeks and Cornwallis is finally forced to surrender after he realizes that his men are not going to get out of this. There's a really interesting story that happens here. Cornwallis is so embarrassed that when he surrenders, he negotiates with Washington. And Washington is going to you know, let the men go home and everything. But Cornwallis asks for something known as the honors of war, where his men would be able to lay down their guns but march off the battlefield under their own flag, under the British flag. And Washington says, absolutely not. You have surrendered. So when it actually came time to do the official surrender, Cornwallis refused to do it. And his second in command is going to go and surrender to Washington. Washington, actually, Cornwallis's second in command is going to try to surrender to the French. The French point to Washington the second command goes to Washington. Washington refuses to surrender and points to his second in command. So it's a whole drama for the Battle of Yorktown and how it ends. Um, the whole thing ends with the Treaty of Paris in 1783. So this war that, that really starts in 1775 doesn't end until 1783 with the Treaty of Paris, 1783. And here's your list of things. You can read... The United States is free and sovereign. The boundaries are established. The U.S. will get the rights to fish off of Canada. Debts will be paid. Land will not be seized anymore. And prisoners of war will be released. When you look at it, the terms are very friendly to the United States. The British uh, could have you know, been a lot less nice because really this war could have continued. Britain could have won in enough time, but Britain just got tired of fighting. And the British were like, okay, if we give the Americans what they want now, they will eventually come back to us. But it never actually happened. All right, um, for this week, uh, one of the things you have to do is your source evaluation worksheet. And I want to show you where to find that real quick. If you go to our class, which is right here, click on Lessons. Go to the research paper Dropbox and instructions, and you'll see right here, source evaluation instructions. The, this is what I need you to do this week. Your Dropbox for it right here is source evaluation. All right, this looks really complicated, but I'm going to simplify it for you. Uh, it says there are four steps to source evaluation. Find a source, evaluate the source, justify the source, use the source. This worksheet will help you with steps two and three, evaluate and justify. What I want you to do is find four to five sources using Galileo or Google Scholar. Use Galileo or Google Scholar. Find four to five sources that match your research topic. And then I want you to answer these questions. I've got an example from another class. Uh, this is a World History One class. And this particular student is looking at Raphael, Michelangelo, Donatello, and Leonardo, the great four uh, creators of the Renaissance. And so he has gone and found four sources, and he's answered these questions. So his first source is right here. And he tells me how he found the source, where the source was located, who the author is, and whether that author is a specialist in their field. Then ob objectivity. Uh, he has told me if this is a work of opinion, if it's a work of fiction, or if it's a work of fact. It's a collection of notes taken on art history. Accuracy. It's peer-reviewed, meaning that the author is respected and the author has had his work reviewed by others. Then currency. Uh, when was it published? So just to show you it here, authority. How did you find the source? Was it through Google Scholar? Was it through Galileo? Is it an online source? Is it a book? Who is the author of the source? And is the author an expert? Objectivity, is it fact or opinion? 
accuracy. How, how do we know that it's a good source or how do we know that it is you know, well-researched? Well, if it's peer-reviewed, that's going to be well-researched. Or you can also look at the sources at the end of your, or the, re the references, I should say, at the end of your source. Does it look like they've done their research? So you're going to do this four or five times, and you can type straight on this source evaluation worksheet and just upload it to Blackboard when you're done between now and the due date. If you have any further questions about this, send me an email. I will check my email a couple of times over the weekend and I will help you with this. All right, um, that's it. It's 30 minutes of your time, a little longer than normal, but thank you for staying with me and I hope you have a great weekend. We'll talk to you soon.